Thank you, Peter, and good evening, everybody. It's not really fair to go last, especially after that, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> I do want to thank the City of New Westminster for the opportunity to present tonight. This is a very important issue for Metro Vancouver. I do have a number of senior officials from Metro Vancouver here with me, although I can't see them. I'm pretty sure they're out there. Uh, <laughs> we have Ray Robb, who's the Regulation and Enforcement Division Manager, somewhere. Uh, Kathy Preston, who's a senior engineer, also in regulation and enforcement. There she is. And uh, my boss, Delia Lagleguerron, who's the general manager of planning, policy, and environment, and also the deputy CAO at Metro Vancouver. I'm not sure where Delia is. So, let me get organized here, sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of the, the presentation I'm going to give tonight. I'm going to give you some context on the Metro Vancouver airshed, the potential impacts of coal shipment activity, what our role is in the review process and how we work with Port Metro Vancouver on that process, and then the next steps for Metro Vancouver, including discussion at our Board of Directors level. We've heard a, a bit of discussion about the activity, coal shipment activity in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and it would be an understatement to say that there's a lot of public concern about coal terminal expansion, not just here in, Port, in, in Metro Vancouver, but throughout the Pacific Northwest. This is a map from a presentation that I attended probably about three weeks ago at a meeting of air quality authorities north and south of the border. And you can certainly see the number of new coal facilities in southern Washington state, proposed coal facilities, some of them quite large. Um, I hope some numbers came up there, in the range of 30 to 40 million tons per year, so larger than the facilities that we're talking about here. And then there is the Gateway Pacific Terminal, just very close to the Canada-US border at Cherry Point in Whatcom County. And that is proposed to be a 48 million ton per year facility. So these Washington State coal facilities are, to my knowledge, all at various stages of applying for their regulatory approvals. None of them in, have been given the go-ahead at this point, and as we've heard, the, the, the process is, is fairly rigorous in the, in the state of Washington. So this is a slide that was provided by the Washington State Department of Ecology. Uh, they've kind of tucked us Canadians up into the top left-hand corner there, but they do, uh, they do show the, uh, the three facilities that are under consideration here. So we have Neptune Terminals, which already exists. It's handling metallurgical coal, but it's proposing to expand from 8 to uh, 18 million tons. Uh, we have the West Shore terminals at Delta Port, already at about probably 27, 28 uh, million tons per year, but with a capacity to get to 33 million tons per year. And then what we're discussing tonight, the Fraser Surrey Docks a facility, which currently does not handle coal, but is proposing to handle as much as 8 million tons per year. And if we looked at, and I think Dr. Van Binder referred to this earlier, in total all of the capacity that's shown on this map is close to 200 million tons per year of coal moving through the Pacific Northwest, largely from the, uh, the Powder River Basin um, uh, uh, mine that you can see on the, the right-hand side of that map there. So what is it that we're concerned about from an air quality perspective? First of all, there's all the engines that are handling the coal. There's rail locomotive engines, there's tugboats hauling barges of coal down the Fraser River uh, to Texada Island, and then there's all the loaders and other equipment at the stationary coal facility itself. And these engines all generally burn some grade of diesel fuel. And reducing exp exposure to diesel particulate matter is one of the priority focus areas in our air quality program at Metro Vancouver. Our assessments, which have been supported by the health authorities, puts the reduction of diesel particulate matter as the number one uh, health uh, uh, priority. And so the number one health risk from exposure to air pollution in our urban airshed comes from diesel particulate matter. And then there's the, the coal dust itself. Dust coming off of the rail cars as they move from the United States to uh, Fraser Surrey docks on barges and at the facility itself. And although it is proposed as a direct from rail to barge transfer, there are emissions anytime you handle coal. And there may also be the temporary storage on site. I'm not going to discuss the health impacts because Dr. Van Binder described that earlier, uh, with the, the health risk associated with exposure to coal dust. So try to uh, tabulate here the different sources and potential impacts and more importantly the government agencies who have what I would describe as primary jurisdiction over these sources. Rail and marine in the first four rows are quite similar. Uh, both coal dust and engine exhaust are a potential source of concern. 
uh, from both an air quality perspective and a health perspective. And in terms of climate change, the larger uh, concern, as we've already heard, is with the transport overseas, so that's the emissions uh, along the ocean-going vessels as we move the, the coal across the ocean, and the end use of coal in the coal-fired power generation systems or even in steel-making processes for metallurgical coal, and Andrew spoke to this earlier. And for both marine and rail transport, the lead jurisdiction is with the federal government uh, under, for example, the Railway Safety Act or the Canada Shipping Act and Environment Canada for different standards re restricting fuel quality. Now, moving to the Fraser Surrey Docks facility itself, this is where both Port Metro Vancouver and Metro Vancouver have a role. Uh, as Greg explained earlier, Port Metro Vancouver would issue a project permit to Fraser Surrey Docks, who are a leaseholder on, uh, on Port Federal lands. And I guess the analogy is this is kind of like a, a building permit that the City of New Westminster would issue to a landowner in this city. Now, Metro Vancouver is the authority for air quality permits and regulations, and I'm going to go drill down into that uh, in the next slide and explain how that, uh, how that works. So under the Provincial Environmental Management Act, Metro Vancouver has the delegated authority for air quality management in this region. We are uh, guided by an overarching air quality management plan. This is our policy framework for managing air quality in the region. Our current plan was adopted by our board of directors and that's elected officials from the 24 local governments that make up Metro Vancouver, the Greater Vancouver Regional District. Uh, our current plan was adopted by our board in 2011. It includes 81 different actions in the areas of improving air quality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now under our delegated authority, our board has the ability to adopt bylaws and regulations regarding air quality. Uh, the main air quality bylaw that we operate under does enable, enable a system of permits which apply to large industrial sources. These are individual facilities, things like cement plants, refineries, chemical plants, and bulk commodities terminals. We currently administer close to 200 permits and a number of these are in fact on port lands. Uh, we have a separate regulation and enforcement group led by Ray Robb, who I introduced earlier. They make the permitting decisions, they carry out the inspections, and they promote compliance with the conditions that are established in the Metro Vancouver air quality permits. So Fraser Terry Docks at this point has been advised that they do need an air permit from Metro Vancouver. Earlier this month, we received an air emissions permit application from Fraser Surrey Docks. And I want to emphasize that this is distinct from the project permit application that Fraser Surrey Docks has submitted to uh, Port Metro Vancouver. So we are in the process of reviewing the permit application, but we've also reviewed the information that they've previously submitted to the port. And on the basis of the information that Fraser Surrey Docks uh, air uh, quality consultants have provided, we've analyzed in terms of the overall air emissions loading in the region. This is the emissions of the sum of all the pollutants that contribute to smog in our uh, airshed. That would include nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, volatile organic compounds, fine particulate matter, and ammonia. And recognizing that Fraser Surrey Docks has indicated they may incrementally increase coal handling capacity as the project proceeds. Uh, we look at the emissions totals uh, in, in the years two to five and years six plus, and that's at four million and eight million tons per year of coal. And we're looking at about 20 to 40 tons of annual emissions. And that isn't huge in the overall context of the airshed. It's actually less than 0.1% of airshed totals. But uh, equally, we have to look at what this means to the local community, and certainly that's why you're all here tonight. The consultants have used a dispersion modeling approach to predict what the concentrations will be in the areas adjacent to the proposed facility. They've concluded uh, a number of things. Firstly, that the particulate concentrations are going to be localized around the Fraser Surrey Docks facility. Uh, the exceedances of the ambient air quality objectives, these are the guidelines and standards that we use to uh, provide benchmarks for the quality of the air. Uh, adjacent to the marine sources and along the fence lines and within the rail yard, there will be exceedances of the uh, ambient air quality objectives. And then beyond the fence line, the modeling that the consultants have done shows low impacts and within ambient air quality objectives. Uh, however, our initial review does leave us with some questions, questions that would have to be addressed as we review the, pro uh, the permit process, the permit application. It certainly appears that not all of the sources of fugitive dust within the facility have been included in the modeling. 
and it also appears that the emissions of coal dust and engine exhaust from barges and locomotives in transit have not been included, and we know these to be a, a significant concern. This is a scoping issue. It's what the, the Fraser Surrey Dock consultants have, assess, have assessed in the area in the vicinity of their proposed facility, and they did not look at the, um, the, uh, the transiting emissions associated with rail cars and barges. So moving forward with Metro Vancouver's role, our staff will review the Fraser Surrey Docks permit application. As noted earlier, we do have these questions about the sources included and the scope of the review conducted to date. We expect that we'll be following up with the proponent on these issues. Uh, ultimately, our regulation and enforcement manager will make an independent and unfettered permitting decision guided by the relevant facts and applicable law. The permit process at Metro Vancouver does include public notification and this is specified under the Provincial Public Notification Regulation. Uh, I do want to emphasize that our permit uh, will not and cannot address sources and emissions uh, associated with transiting of coal. And this is the barges and locomotives that I noted earlier, which are primarily under the jurisdiction of the federal government, Transport Canada, and Environment Canada. So these emissions are definitely of a concern, and the need for appropriate mitigation measures and monitoring will be raised with Port Metro Vancouver and the, uh, the federal government agencies. So lastly, in terms of how we work with the port, for the most part, we've worked fairly well collaboratively with the port. There are a number of uh, success stories, including the Northwest Port's Clean Air Strategy, which is a strategy uh, with actions that are uh, endorsed by not just Met Port Metro Vancouver, but also the Port of Seattle and the Port of Tacoma. Uh, the port has an air action program. They have a truck licensing system, which requires that only newer, low emission trucks can access port gates. And we have a shore power system at Canada Place, which basically means that cruise ships, when they're berthed at the port, can actually shut off their diesel generators. And again, diesel is one of our uh, most significant concerns and plug into electrical grid systems. Uh, having said that, we believe that the process of referring projects between Port Metro Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, the health authorities, and the senior levels of government could certainly be improved. And I should stress that that works both ways. Um, comparing notes and collaborating in advance of permit decisions would allow us to jointly scope out the environmental assessment process. I'm sure that would also make life easier for the applicant. We would want to include the health authorities in this for their expertise in health impact assessment. So the next steps for uh, Metro Vancouver, uh, our board of directors will be considering this issue on our, at their meeting on June 14th. Uh, this issue has already uh, gone through our Environment and Parks Committee, which is a, uh, a subcommittee, if you will, of the board that advises the board on matters related to both environment and regional parks. Uh, it has gone through that committee on two occasions, and their recommendations are going forward to the board on June 14th. The recommendations that are coming from the committee are firstly that uh, the, the board should express its opposition to coal shipments from the Fraser River estuary, other than through the existing Roberts Bank coal port. Also to call on the port for a more formalized referral process between Port Metro Vancouver and Metro Vancouver. Uh, support for the inclusion of the health impact assessments which uh, Dr. Van Binder spoke of earlier. And finally advocating to the senior governments for mitigation measures, not only the mitigation measures but the follow-up monitoring to address emission sources that are not within Metro Vancouver's permitting jurisdiction. So that's where I'll close. I understand we're taking questions from all of the panelists at the end, and I am the last panelist, so I think we're moving into question period. Uh, there's a graphic here of our Caring for the Air document, which I think I left about 50 copies of at the, the front table, and it's a, a document that describes all of the air quality programs that we have in Metro Vancouver, so if you have a chance to pick that up, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>